the swelling tsunami everyone underestimates, which is swelling after knee replacement surgery. And it's not a small issue. It's one of the most underestimated reasons recovery slows down, motion stays limited, and pain lingers long after the incision heals. If this is your first time here, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. I'm Dr. John Chuback, and I'm a cardiovascular surgeon, but swelling is something that's near and dear to my heart, and I've spent a lot of my career focused on it. Today, we're diving into a colleague of mine's work, Dr. Andrew Wickline, and his paper, Mitigating the Postoperative Swelling Tsunami in Total Knee Arthroplasty, A Call to Action. Dr. Wickline is somebody that I know personally have worked with for a number of years now, and this orthopedic surgeon from upstate New York has really become impassioned about this subject. Today, we're going to look at what causes the swelling tsunami, as he calls it, a tsunami being a gigantic tidal wave, and how it damages his recovery, what strategies his paper recommends, and why supporting the veins and the lymphatic system, that's where I've come into place here, may be the missing piece. Stay with me until the end because I'm going to share with you how compounds like MPFF or micronized purified flavonoid fraction, which is a combination of flavonoids that includes diosmin and hesperidin, which are micronized for greater absorption, can actually reinforce these same mechanisms and help control postoperative swelling by supporting a normal venous and lymphatic system. After total knee arthroplasty, many patients experience extreme swelling that can persist for weeks or even months. Dr. Wickline and his colleagues call it a tsunami because it arrives fast, peaks hard, and disrupts everything in its path. This is not harmful puffiness. Persistent edema increases pain, delays physical therapy, restricts range of motion, slows wound healing, and can even raise the risk of infection. Let me give you a plain English analogy. Imagine trying to move a door that's on a brand new beautiful hinge but it's submerged in water until the water drains out of the way that movement feels heavily impeded almost impossible the same principle applies to a swollen knee the key idea here is that even if you put in a brand new knee joint that should work beautifully if it's surrounded by swelling and water and resistance it's going to be very difficult for that beautiful knee joint to function properly the central notion of dr wickline's paper is that swelling is not inevitable. It is measurable, preventable, and treatable if we address the circulatory biology behind it. So let's talk a little bit about what causes swelling. Well, initially, surgery sets off a predictable inflammatory cascade. Capillaries become leaky, and mediators like histamine and prostaglandins rise. Fluid and proteins seep into the surrounding tissues. The lymphatic system, which normally clears that fluid, becomes overloaded and dysfunctional. Venous blood flow slows because of pain and immobility, which reduce calf muscle pumping. The result is a closed feedback loop. Inflammation causes swelling, swelling limits motion, and limited motion fuels more swelling. In plain language, think of your knee like a neighborhood drain system after a storm. If the drains clog, water builds up and damages everything nearby. The body's version of unclogging that system is early motion, compression, and supporting microvascular tone and function. So why does this matter so much? Why is Dr. Wickline so emphatic about battling swelling after knee replacements? Well, Dr. Wickline's group found that swelling has a direct impact on outcomes. Patients with high residual edema often use more narcotics, report worse pain scores, take longer to regain full extension and flexion, and stay in therapy longer. His paper argues that orthopedic teams should be treating swelling with the same rigor as infection prevention or pain control. And I couldn't agree more. If we don't measure edema, we can't manage it properly. And so that's a very important part of his process. Dr. Wickline outlines a very specific call to action. He and his co-authors outline three pillars for better recovery. He argues that measurement and standardization create reproducible grading tools for swelling using limb girth measurements, digital imaging, or bioimpedance. They also argue in favor of multimodal intervention. This includes combining mechanical, physical, and pharmacologic methods instead of relying on a single approach. They go on to support data and collaboration. They wish to build a national or multi-center registry to track swelling outcomes and refine evidence-based protocols. This structure transforms edema control from guesswork into science. 
Another analogy would be like finally giving every team the same rule book instead of playing the game differently at every hospital. The tsunami paper outlines a phase by phase strategy. There's the preoperative phase where patients are educated on why swelling matters. Nutrition is optimized, hydration is optimized, and blood sugar control is optimized. Dr. Wickline's group talks about encouraging prehab to stimulate circulation before surgery. Then there's the intraoperative phase. They like to minimize turn time and tissue trauma during the operation itself and maintain hemostasis, meaning control bleeding, and promote gentle handling of the tissues to limit inflammation. The post-operative phase starts with early guided movement. He also recommends using compression wraps or pneumatic sleeves. Elevation of the limb is used and applying cooling devices consistently is found to be effective. Then, of course, it's important to monitor and record swelling daily. The takeaway here is simple. Prevention begins before the first incision and continues until the patient achieves full range of motion. Compression, cryotherapy, and movement form the mechanical core of edema management. Compression keeps small vessels from leaking and encourages venous and lymphatic return. Cold therapy reduces inflammation, and movement activates the calf muscle pump and those lymphatic channels to function normally. According to Dr. Wickline's team, these methods must start early and continue regularly for best results. Sporadic use does not prevent the tsunami. Consistency does. And don't we find that to be true with so many things in health and wellness? Now let's talk about why microvascular health matters. This is something that I'm obviously very passionate about. Here's where my background in vascular medicine, vascular surgery, and cardiovascular health overlaps with orthopedic recovery. The smallest blood vessels called capillaries and venous control how much fluid escapes into the tissues. The lymphatic system acts like a little sump pump. This system clears that excess fluid that can collect in soft tissues back into the circulation. If those micro vessels lose tone or become inflamed or become leaky, swelling escalates. This is why strengthening the microcirculation and supporting the function of the microcirculation can make the mechanical measures far more effective. In plain language, you can mop the floor all day long, but if the pipe keeps leaking, you're never going to clean up that floor and solve the problem. Strengthening the vessel walls fixes the leak itself. Now let's talk about MPFF, micronized purified flavonoid fraction, and nutraceutical type support. This is where we're bridging vascular and orthopedic knowledge and recovery after knee replacement. Although Dr. Wickline's article focuses on surgical and mechanical strategies, it acknowledges that swelling is a biological process that also benefits from pharmacological, nutraceutical, and dietary supplement support. This is where micronized purified flavonoid fraction, or MPFF, plays an important role. MPFF is a combination of natural citrus bioflavonoids, mainly diosmin and hesperidin. These are backed by over 30 years of clinical research that's been done around the world and largely in Europe. It's consistently been shown to strengthen venous tone, reduce capillary permeability, enhance lymphatic drainage, and decrease inflammatory mediators. These mechanisms directly target the same biology Dr. Wickline describes as microvascular leak, venous stasis, and lymphatic overload. In simple terms, MPFF reinforces the plumbing system itself, while compression and cooling manage visible swelling. MPFF helps to prevent the leaks that cause edema or swelling in the first place. Clinical studies have shown MPFF can reduce leg volume, shorten recovery times, and improve microcirculatory performance. That's why it appears in multiple European guidelines and American guidelines as a recommended adjunct for venous and lymphatic support. This overlap between vascular science and orthopedic rehabilitation and surgery is precisely why MPFF became one of the core ingredients in the vein and lymphatic support formulas that I helped to design at Vitasport MD. Our goal is to strengthen the body's normal circulatory function, working from the inside out to complement mechanical recovery that Dr. Wick line recommends in his paper. When used alongside compression, mobility, and nutrition, MPFF acts as a natural dietary supplement that helps to create a bridge between surgical healing and vascular restoration. Ultimately, Dr. Wickline's call to action highlights a broader medical truth. Long-term 
recovery depends on both physical therapy and microvascular health. Now let's talk about standardizing measurements and tracking. The Tsunami paper urges every care team to measure swelling in a reproducible way. That could mean limb circumference at fixed landmarks or advanced imaging tools. That data should then guide decisions. For example, when to adjust compression levels, when to escalate therapy, when to consider adjunct treatments. Objective measurement transforms recovery from guesswork into evidence. Now let's touch on what Dr. Wickline calls the multidisciplinary model. What makes this article so special in part is its author list. It includes surgeons, physical therapists, wound care specialists, and lymphatic experts. Their shared message is that edema management is not a single discipline task. The surgeon limits trauma, the therapist restores motion, and the vascular specialist optimizes drainage. Together, they can calm the swelling tsunami before it overwhelms the patient. So what should patients know? If you're preparing for knee replacement, here are some practical takeaways drawn from this paper by Dr. Andrew Wickline. Number one, swelling is expected, but but manageable when addressed proactively. Number two, follow your compression and elevation plan consistently, not just for the first few days. Number three, stay hydrated and eat nutrient-dense foods to support vessel health. Number four, ask your surgical team how they measure and track swelling. Number five, discuss whether a venolymphatic support strategy, such as MPFF, is appropriate for you. Recovery is smoother when surgical care and circulatory health work in harmony. The broader message here is measure to manage. Dr. Wickline's closing line summarizes the entire challenge. He says, quote, until we measure, we can't manage, end quote. For years, swelling was treated as unavoidable. This paper paper calls for a new culture, a cultural shift where surgeons, therapists, and patients treat this problem as controllable and manageable. When we measure edema, apply multimodal care, and strengthen the microcirculation, we transform recovery from reactive to proactive. In closing, let's do a recap. Swelling is a biological process, not a cosmetic side effect. The best results come from standardized measurement and multimodal therapy. Compression, cooling, and motion are essential. Supporting venous and lymphatic tone through microvascular care can amplify these effects. In my view, integrating vascular science into orthopedic recovery is one of the most promising frontiers in medicine. Another significant advancement in managing and measuring postoperative swelling after a knee replacement is something called the Inkwell device. I know that this is something that Dr. Wickline uses in his practice, and it's a novel new approach to measuring both range of motion and swelling in postoperative patients. And again, measurement is incredibly important. Tell me in the comments what part of recovery after total knee replacement you found the most challenging. And tell me what helped you the most. Did you try any of the things that we've listed in this tsunami article? Together we can move forward safely and more comfortably toward total proper healing. I'm Dr. John Chuback, and I thank you for tuning in to this important literature review. Please leave your comments below. I hope you'll like and subscribe and share this video with anybody that you think might find it helpful. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much.